Let me get started. I'm going to talk about some joint work with Sam Grushevsky, Gabriele Mondello, and Ricardo Salvatimani on compact subvarieties of AG. So I want to start with the following question. Given a quasi-projective variety X, how do we say how far X is from being a projective variety? You could, of course, ask the question, and it's slightly different if you replace the word projective with proper or compact over C. I'm going to stick to this formulation because it's the most convenient. There's a few ways to measure this. So we can go sort of top down. How much do you have to excise from a compact variety to get X? So you can consider compactifications, X bar of X, and uh, look at the dimension of the boundary and take the minimum of that overall compactifications. Or you can go bottom up. You can ask, well, what's the largest dimension of a projective subvariety of X? Um, and for example, if X is affine by this notion that's maximally non-compact because it only has points. And then you can also say, well, maybe I have one projective subvariety of large dimension or a couple. Maybe I want to know generically sort of how close am I to being projective. So you ask for the same question. There's a few ways to, to say it, but through a generic point. Essentially, you ask, given a random point of X, if you're over a field like C, you can literally ask for sort of measure one. Uh, otherwise, you can say outside of a countable union of subvarieties or something. But however you formalize it, you can say, let me take a general point of X and let's look at the maximal dimension of a projective subvariety through that point. There's a few sort of fairly obvious relations uh, between these notions. Obviously, the maximal possible projective subvariety has at least as big a dimension as the maximal dimension of a subvariety through a general point of X. And by Bertini's theorem, if you have a compactification with sort of boundary that's not too small, not too big, excuse me, you can just keep intersecting with random hyperplanes and you eventually cut away uh, the entire boundary. That'll be the generic behavior, in fact. So we have this relation that the maximal generic dimension, which is what I illustrate here with this notation, plus the dimension of the boundary in a compactification is at least as big as um, the dimension of X minus one. So we have these three different relations. And for the purpose of this talk, I'll focus on the two sort of bottom up notions of the maximal generic dimension and the maximal dimensions of compact subvarieties. Okay, so moreover, let me specialize a lot immediately. Uh, I have very little to say about general varieties. Let's focus on a specific variety namely the moduli space of uh, principally polarized abelian varieties, which I'm going to write as AG. And just for context, the dimension of AG is G plus one choose two, so written up here. So to get our bearings straight, um, the talk will, for the most part, be over the complex numbers, but just for, for this part to illustrate the story, if you work over FP or FP bar, the maximal dimension is at least G choose two, which is quite high. The co-dimension is only G, which you can get it by looking at the super singular locus, sort of properly interpreted as a subvariety of AG. And uh, Ort conjectured that this behavior is in contrast with characteristic zero, where you have to do strictly worse. And this was proven by Keo and Sadun back in 2003. They showed that uh, you can sort of do one better you can, uh, the maximum dimensions at most, g, g minus one over two, minus one. The previous bound without the minus one here was known before. Uh, there were a few proofs, uh, the simplest being using cohomological methods, and their sort of main thrust was to go one further. Now, uh, the bailey borel compactification uh, of AG has a boundary which looks like AG minus one, so by our reasoning above, if you have a small boundary, this isn't that small, but it's somewhat small, you can get a lower bound for um, the maximal dimension of a compact subvariety. And so that works out to G minus one. This is what you get if you just intersect enough random hyperplanes to get something compact. So uh, the theorem I wanna talk about sort of solves this question completely for this particular variety. So first of all, over the complex numbers, from now on everything is entirely over the complex numbers. If you look at a generic point of AG, and we can specify precisely what uh, generic means, at least what it includes, uh, the maximal dimension of a compact subvariety is at most, is, is equal to G minus one. In fact, you can't do any better. And if you just care about um, 
compact subvariety is not through a general point, you get this funny behavior where up until 16, you can't do better than this G minus one. And then uh, once you pass 16, you transition to this slowly growing, but quadratic function, G squared over 16 rounded down if G is even. And if G is odd, you just drop down to the smallest even number below, the largest even number below G minus one and do the same thing. Uh, Jacob, um, there's, yes. there's a question, uh, Wishy Goldring, he asked the, about uh, the super senior locus, if that should rather be the uh, the P rank zero locus in, in positive characteristic. I apologize. Yes, the P rank zero locus. Thank you. Um, okay. Other corrections or questions are, are, uh, are welcome. Um, okay, so this is the main result that um, I want to talk about. So just to sort of illustrate what these numbers look like, uh, here's this nice table that Sengushevsky made that I like. So I'm gonna copy it here. Of um, So here we have the um, just dimension, sorry, this should be an equal sign. This is just the dimension of AG. This is how big it is. And then uh, Kiel and Sadun's bound, just above it of the maximal dimension of a compact subvariety. So you can see it's pretty close. You're saving just over a G. And then theorem B and theorem A are sort of the truth. If you want a maximal compact subvariety, then you just sort of have G minus one here, and then you transition to the slowly growing quadratic behavior. And then if you look at a large number like a hundred, you basically get one eighth of the dimension um, of AG. That's sort of the best you can do. And then for a generic guy, you just get G minus one. So a fairly simple table, uh, but just to illustrate uh, the sort of behavior that we're seeing. So uh, one observation about this is that even though we're showing that the high dimensional, which means for the purpose of, of this problem, at least G dimensional compact subvarieties of AG are not generic. They're sort of constrained. They're in a countable union of Zariski subvarieties. Uh, there's still quite a lot of them. They're in fact Zariski dense and moreover, they're topologically dense. And in fact, you could have known this ahead of time that the maximal dimensional guys would have been dense because AG is equipped with Hecke operators, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more later. And they are these finite correspondences that essentially, if you have a compact subvariety of AG, you can apply any Hecke operator to it and get another compact subvariety of the same dimension. Hecke operators have very large orbits, so it's not surprising that you have you get sort of this dense set of counterexamples uh, once you have one. And uh, we'll give a little bit later, not just the theorem on dimensions, but a fairly precise classification of all maximal compact subvarieties sort of in this case. Okay, before proceeding to um, something like the proof, some kind of description of, of what goes on, uh, let me just briefly, uh, in a few words, say something about MG. Of the four authors of this paper, I am the least MG literate. So this is me sort of trying to do justice to what was the original motivation for this question, though, as sort of often happens, if you ask a question for MG and then the same question for AG, the one for AG ends up being a lot easier. Um, but nonetheless, let's look at MG, the moduli space of complex, smooth, projective curves of genus G. And it's natural for this problem, at least for our approach to this problem, to consider something a little bit bigger this uh, moduli of curves of compact type, which you can essentially think of as you take a bunch of curves whose genera add up to G, for example, and you put them together in a tree um, by just by gluing them along points. So the usual Torelli map from MG to AG extends to a Torelli map from MG compact type to AG. And the advantage of considering uh, this map is that it's proper as opposed to uh, MG, whose image is not proper. We'll describe a second in, in a second. The downside of looking at this map instead of looking at the map from MG is that the map from MG is pretty much injective, if you say it properly, um, whereas this map is not. It has positive dimensional fibers, in fact, essentially stemming from where you glue two curves together. Because if you take hyperbolic curves, then the points on them are all different. They're not the same up to automorphism. 
Okay, so to give some uh, some context for this, um, there's a result of Diaz, which uh, gives this upper bound for the maximal dimension of a compact subvert if mg is at most g minus two. Um, and Kiel Sadun actually improved Diaz as a result for mg compact type by showing the maximal dimension in this case is at most two g minus four if g is at least three. So if you um, basically use the Kiel Sadun method, but uh, follow uh, our result from AG, you sort of copy them and you import them into MG compact type just by considering it as a sub variety of AG. We can improve these bounds up to 23. We get the upper bound for MG compact type of this 3G over 2 minus 2. And for its image in AG, which potentially has much smaller dimension because you're contracting a bunch of positive dimensional fibers, we get a bound of G minus 1 until the transition region happens beyond 15. And in principle, we could attempt to get the G minus one uh, for all G, but we'd have to deal with things sort of of, of silver pink type, or you know maybe of uh, the Coleman conjecture type, because we'd be understanding the intersection of MG with certain Shimura varieties, as I'll, as I'll say. Okay, so what's the story for um, MG? Well, if you really do care about MG instead of MG compact type or the closure of MG in AG, which is J of MG compact type, you should really consider its map not to AG, but to the indecomposable locus of AG, which is basically uh, that subset of AG, those abelian varieties, principally polarized abelian varieties, which do not correspond to a product of two other abelian varieties with the principal polarization such that the principal polarization is induced from the product. So there's a little bit of an annoyance here because you got to keep track of the polarization, otherwise you're removing too much. But if you look at this indecomposable locus, then this map, in fact, um, is proper. And if you just import our results to AG indecomposable, you still get the upper bound of G minus one for the dimension of a compact subvariety through a generic point. The lower bound now you get is G minus two, because instead of just removing the boundary of AG, you have to remove the boundary of AG in decomposable, which includes this A1 cross AG minus one. So that boundary is one dimension higher. So your lower bound becomes G minus two. Uh, I put this here because I think it's quite tantalizing. We sort of spent some time trying to figure out which bound is correct. And uh, I, at least personally, am not sure. So this is an interesting question to sort of potentially try and get a hold of. Okay, but that's the story for MG, and that's basically all I'm planning to say about that. Okay, so let me switch to uh, the idea of the proof, which is uh, very simple. Uh, the idea is as follows. Suppose you have a proper subvariety X of AG, and let's say his dimension is larger than expected, meaning larger than you can just force with this Bertini argument, so at least G. And now we're going to consider a very specific subvariety of AG, which is the image of A1 cross AG minus 1. It's the largest dimensional subvariety of the decomposable locus, largest dimensional component. Call it map iota. And iota is almost injective. It's a bit tricky because there's some stacky issues and stuff and some weird points. But regardless, this is a finite morphism. So in particular, if something goes to the boundary and goes to infinity sort of here, then it goes to infinity in AG as well. In particular, if I fix an elliptic curve and I look at all uh, principally polarized abelian varieties, which are that elliptic curve product something, that becomes a co-dimension G subvariety. And as the elliptic curve degenerates, the, that family uh, of subvarieties also degenerate to infinity. Now, if you look at our X, it can't intersect this uh, family of sub these subvarieties if E is close enough to the boundary because X is proper, it's contained within the interior. But everything here is algebraic. So we learned that for almost all E, all but finitely many, which I'm denoting with this for all prime symbol, X does not intersect uh, these subvarieties. Okay, so that's useful, but even more useful 
is the following statement that for any E, for any of these subvarieties, if X does intersect it, the intersection can't be what I'm going to call likely. Likely meaning of the right dimension. So if X is dimension G, you would expect naively this intersection to be points. Otherwise, you'd expect it to have dimension, the sum of these two dimensions minus the dimension of AG. And the point is, if it had the right dimension anywhere, then you could deform E a little bit and the intersection would still have to exist. It, it can't it, uh, it can disappear uh, just by whatever, complex analysis or local considerations. Uh, so therefore these intersections when they exist are nowhere likely. This is good because it sort of gives us some information. It contradicts a naive but reasonable intuition that if you have two sub varieties whose dimension adds up to at least the ambient dimension, then you would expect them to intersect. But there's no contradiction here. Maybe X just doesn't intersect this entire product, the image of it in AG, and then we're sort of stuck. What we have to do is we take this idea and we have to upgrade it a little bit. <clears throat> so let me take a brief digression into Hecke operators. Apologize for this brace not being closed. So let's consider that um, AG has a complex uniformization, uh, very similar to how the modular curve is uniformized by the upper half plane. You can look at G by G symmetric complex matrices, such that the imaginary part, instead of being positive, like it would for the usual upper half plane, is positive definite. And it has an action by the symplectic group, um, just like SL2 acts in the upper half plane. And if you quotient out by the integral points, then you get the complex points of AG. There's some care to be paid here with respect to stacky points, but none of it is, is relevant to, to our talk. The dimension of compact subvarieties doesn't change. If you increase level, you can make everything a fine moduli scheme. So for those who are aware of these issues, this is just not a, not a substantial deal for us. Okay, now if you have a any element of SP2GR, then acting by it gives you a map, a, a well-defined morphism from Ziegel space to itself. But if this H has rational coordinates, then this morphism descends not to an actual map, but to a finite correspondence uh, between AG and itself. And we call this correspondence a Hecke operator. So basically we can take a point, look at all possible liftings to Ziegel space, act by H on all of these liftings, descend it back down, and you will get a finite set of points in AG. And this gives us our Hecke correspondence. So the exact same reasoning as above, um, but instead of with these families, with the Hecke operator applied to these families, goes through because it's some sequence of varieties that degenerates to the boundary. So as a result, we learned that for all elliptic curves and for all Hecke operators, T sub H, the intersection of X with any Hecke operator applied to any of these varieties is nowhere likely. This is much better now because we have a ton of varieties and these varieties are, you know, there's a risky dense, they're topologically dense, they're in a reasonable sense dense in some jet space uh, that you can define, but it still doesn't win the day for us. In particular, the, the main enemy for using this approach is uh, the possibility that X still doesn't intersect any of these varieties. And then you sort of can't get started. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this idea and we're gonna upgrade it to, instead of working with just rational H, we're gonna work with real H. And the problem with this approach is you can't do it now on AG because you don't have any finite correspondences. So instead we're gonna work up in Ziegel space and do a very similar kind of story. So let's let X tilde be the pre-image of X in Ziegel space. This is now a complex analytic subvariety of a bounded domain, a Hermitian symmetric space, but it's it's by no means algebraic or semi-algebraic or anything like that. It's not a priori. And I want to upgrade this claim. And to do that, I'm going to work on X tilde in HG in Ziegel space instead of on AG. And so the claim is that for any real H now, if I look at the intersection of X tilde with just H applied to not this variety, 
but its natural pre-image inside Ziegel space, which looks much the same way. You have H1 cross Hg minus one sit inside Ag, just by looking at block diagonal matrices, and you just fix the upper left entry and let the rest of them vary. And then you just act by H. And if these two intersect at a point, I claim that intersection must be unlikely, must have larger dimension than expected. And again, the proof is very simple because the property of having likely non-empty intersections is stable under, under deformations. So if this was true, you had a likely intersection, you would have one for a nearby H and near any real point, there's a rational point lurking. And if you had a rational H with a likely intersection, well, then you could push everything down to a G and you would get a likely intersection over here with the intersection of X with some Hecke operator applied to this locus. Okay, so now we've upgraded to real H. And this is great because these intersections we can guarantee exist for the simple reason that the symplectic group acts transitively on Ziegel space. So what you can do is you can pick a point here, you can pick a point on X tilde and just take your H to make sure that that point gets mapped to your point on X tilde and you get an intersection. And we can do this a lot for any point of X tilde and all these intersections have to be unlikely. Okay, so this brings us to the study of unlikely intersections, which fortunately for this project uh, has already been a, a well-studied field for a long time. So let me um, remind you how uh, what sort of the contours are. So to understand these sort of unlikely intersections, you have to understand so-called weakly special subvarieties um, of AG, and there's a whole literature on them. You can define them in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, I'll define them one way here, which are there those irreducible algebraic varieties of AG, such that if you look at their pre-image in Ziegel space and look at the connected components of that pre-image, uh, then these are complex analytic varieties. And moreover, we'd like them to be Hermitian symmetric subdomains uh, of Ziegel space, so totally geodesic. Um, they themselves have the structure of a Hermitian symmetric space mod some lattice, much like Ziegel space. Uh, and they have the structure of a Shimura variety by virtue of this. And in fact, these weakly special subvarieties can be alternatively characterized as the images of Shimura varieties under Shimura morphisms. So there's some appropriate category there, an appropriate category of morphisms. And um, you can think of them that way. Now, the way the story works is that if you take any subvariety X of AG, then it lies in a smallest weakly special subvariety. These things are closed under intersection. You can call this the weakly special closure of X, which you can characterize using the monodromic group of X, or you can characterize using uh, an appropriate mumford tate group, looking at the variation of hard structures induced from the family of abelian varieties. Whatever it is, any X has this sort of weakly special closure. And how do these weakly special subvarieties lie in AG? Well, they come in discretely many families, in fact, given by what are called strongly special subvarieties. And they're classified by certain semi-simple subgroups of the symplectic group. You can think of it in various ways, but there's some purely sort of representation theoretic or Lie group theoretic characterization uh, of these things. Okay, so as far as transcendence goes, they're kind of the key to the castle. So you can characterize them a different way by saying the following. You can look at the map from Ziegel space, sorry, from HG, yeah, Ziegel space to, to AG, to the moduli space. Now, this is an algebraic variety. And Ziegel, and the Ziegel space is a Hermitian symmetric domain, so it's not an algebraic variety, but it's an open semi-algebraic domain inside an algebraic variety, namely inside affine space. And so, we can still talk about algebraic subvarieties of HG just by talking about algebraic subvarieties of the ambient affine space intersected with HG. Or you can use a semi algebraic structure or whatever you like, but it's not so hard to talk about algebraic structures here. And this sort of mantra, which has been well and pretty much formally justified at this point, uh, is that any algebraic information that sort of persists between this transcendental map 
is explainable by the presence of these weekly special subarrays. So if they if if they didn't exist, there would just be no algebraic tr no transfer of algebraic data between these two. And to the extent that there is, it's because these things exist. So that's a vague statement. Let me uh, justify it for you by giving you a statement of what's known as Axe Shanuel, the sort of at least one way, maybe one of the main ways that these things are uh, formalized. And I'll give it to you in sort of a, a, a general form. But the idea is, again, this mantra of understanding the relationship between algebraic structures on your Hermitian symmetric domain and down on your Shimura variety. So if the slide's not understandable, that's okay. We'll move past this language by the next slide. So if you take any Shimura datum and any Shimura variety of the form a Hermitian symmetric domain, model lattice gamma, and you look at this natural projection, so you can think of Ziegel space mapping to AG, then your Hermitian symmetric domain naturally sits inside some projective variety as an open subdomain, which is this D check plus. In the case of the upper half plane, this just becomes P1. In the case of Ziegel space, it's some appropriate Grassmannian. And uh, the theorem, which I'm going to call, which is pretty much known as weak x channel, a slightly stronger version you can formulate. Uh, and this version that I'm stating here was proved by uh, myself, uh, Mock, and, uh, and Pila. Is the following. If you take an algebraic subvariety upstairs, which I'm going to call W, and an algebraic subvariety downstairs, which I'm going to call X, then you can intersect them by, you can take W and push it forward to S, but it's cleaner to take X and pull it back to your Hermitian symmetric space. And if you intersect them and you get some irreducible component with dimension larger than you would naively expect, then there must be a weakly special subvariety responsible for it. In other words, the image of this component inside your Shimura variety must be contained inside a proper weakly special subvariety. So to tie it back to our question with our compact subvariety X, basically we know it has unlikely intersection with all of these algebraic subvarieties upstairs. These translates by H elements of SP2G of these uh, Hermitian subdomains, H1 cross Hg minus one, all those intersections must lie inside weakly special subvarieties. So this theorem, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail about it, but there's been a lot of work on it by a whole bunch of people beginning with X and work on it sort of is continuing. It's kind of functional transcendent stuff. And um, as a result, what we learn immediately without sort of doing any further analysis is that if you have any compact subvariety X of dimension at least G, its weakly special closure can't be AG. It must be contained inside a proper weakly special subvariety. Because again, if it were, you would have too many of these unlikely intersections. They could not be accounted for by weakly special subvarieties. Okay, so let's gather up what we have so far. We're basically learning that uh, any compact X of larger dimension expected yields all of these unlikely intersections. And these unlikely intersections must be accounted for by weakly special subvarieties. Now we have to say something about these weakly special subvarieties. And of particular interest to us are, is this difference between compact and non-compact, specifically for our problem. So we have the following classification theorem, which we proved, but it's, it's pretty much putting together uh, uh, a lot of the work that's been done on understanding Shimura varieties. Uh, I don't know exactly who to cite for this. Uh, Milne has the version that we ended up using, but he uses work of Borovoy a lot, and you can sort of mention the lean, not mention the lean, and then you should also probably mention Shimura, and there's a bunch of people, but I'll, I'll suffice it for these three names for now. And you have the following very nice theorem, uh, suppose you have any weakly special subvariety of uh, AG. Then what you can do is you can basically split it up into its compact and non-compact parts. So the Shimura variety up to isogeny can be written as a product of a compact part SC with a non-compact part SNC, where each of them sits inside a smaller AG, AG compact and AG non-compact. In, in the way where 
uh, where G compact plus G non compact is G, and it sits inside the product basically of AG compact cross AG non compact. So essentially, any Shimura subvariety, you can take this product locus, take a Shimura subvariety in each, apply a Hecke operator. This gives you the general case where you have the following properties. The, the compact part is compact, as you would expect. This is straight up a compact Shimura variety. And the non compact part is strictly non compact meaning it has no compact Shimura factors. So every Shimura variety breaks up, just like semi-simple groups, into a product of so-called so indecomposable Shimura varieties. And uh, the condition is that each of those is non-compact. This is nothing to do with a question that we'll use it. It's just a, a theorem about the structure of weakly special subvarieties. So as a corollary, we get this basically classification theorem already, which is the following, that if you want the maximal compact subvarieties of AG, well, up to isogeny, they all lie in something like this because the weakly special closure of X some variety S. Now for it to be maximal, X might as well have S sub C as a full product. You're not losing anything by including the full compact Shimura subvariety because you want the maximal guy. So there's no reason to take a proper sub. So you get the structure of X and C, the non-compact part, cross the full compact Shimura variety inside AGC cross AGNC. And then the other piece of this corollary is that in fact, you're not doing anything interesting with a non-compact part. The dimension you're getting there is just the Bertini dimension of G non-compact minus one. You can't do any better without getting a compact Shimura factor. So why is this true? Well, most of this theorem we've already done. We know X is a proper weekly special closure. We know it breaks up in this way. We know the compact part might as well be the full compact Shimura variety. So the only thing that remains to be shown is that this non-compact part, you can't do better than G and C minus one. Okay, so why is that true? Well, essentially we want to play the game we have so far. X non-compact, its weekly special closure is S non-compact. So if we can play the same game with this A1 cross AG minus one, we would get unlikely intersections. Functional transcendence would tell us that that can't happen. And therefore you don't have any um, X of dimension larger than G non-compact. So to play the same game, we sort of need to find something like this inside of S non-compact. And it's actually a fun fact that I didn't know, maybe experts in Shimura varieties knew this, but in case people work with Shimura varieties and didn't, um, any non-compact Shimura variety has to contain a copy of the modular curve straight up, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting and gives you sort of an in to understanding these guys. So to find um, such a product family, we get by by just showing that in fact, what you can do is take an appropriate Hecke translate of the family you're using in AG and just intersect with your non-compact Shimura variety. Basically by using Schmidt's work on variations of hot structures, forgetting you're in a Shimura variety and just using that a family of abelian varieties gives you a variation of hot structures, you can show that some intersection like this is not empty. And the one that's not empty, you can make the same, um, same argument go through. Okay, so it remains to finish the problem <clears throat> to determine the compact Shimura subvarieties of AG. We've reduced from studying arbitrary varieties to this very specific family of compact Shimura subvarieties. And um, this is where the interesting transitions come from. This is the switch at G equals 16 just comes from classifying compact Shimura subvarieties. They sort of exist in large dimension, but it doesn't kick in for a while. So how does this game sort of work? Well, it's hard to fully classify them. It's similar to, and depending on your perspective, harder or easier to classifying semi-simple subgroups of the symplectic group over Q, which in some sense has kind of been done with a few specific exceptions that are tricky, like um, the, uh, the, the eight is, uh, is an exception and a couple of other small V groups are hard to deal with. But for the most part, they've been fully classified uh, just using quadratic forms. So quadratic or skew, quadratic sort of symplectic and Hermitian and skew Hermitian forms using all of these forms, you can construct pretty much every single 
um, semi-simple group over Q, which is really cool. It's this classical group, which is all that is going to come up for us. Um, and uh, again, work of, I'm going to say, Delin Borovoy and Milne. Specifically, we're going to use Milne's presentation of this. Classify not only Shimura varieties in some sense, but their embeddings to AG. And the game ends up being, you have to look at sort of Dinkin diagrams and certain special roots and synthetic representations. Then you have to worry about real forms and compact forms uh, and so on. But that's, it becomes sort of this very Lee theoretic representation theoretic question. So um, you can sort of do it. I don't know, there's a bunch of combinatorics and optimization to rule out a bunch of cases, but there's nothing particularly enlightening to say about it that I can do here. So instead, let me give you the maximal case um, how you actually construct these compact Shimura subvarieties of dimension G squared over 16. And here's one way to do it. It's not the only way, but in some sense, it is the only way for large G, sort of the only way after twists and isogeny and, and stuff like that. Um, so what you do is you pick a real quadratic field F and you take a totally imaginary extension of it E, so E is degree four over Q. And then you pick a Hermitian form on e to the 2g, um, whose signature, now there's two signatures because you have two different embeddings of f, each of which give you a different signature. And one of the signatures we want to be gg. This is to make the dimension of the Shimura variety that results as large as possible. And the other one we're gonna take to be definite, 2g comma zero. And this is to ensure that the Shimura variety is compact at the end of the day being compact is sort of equivalent to your corresponding semi-simple group being anisotropic over R. And uh, the easiest slash almost the only way to do this is to make one of its uh, factors compact. So then you get an action of the uh, unitary group of F, the special unitary group on E to the 2G, which as a vector space is just Q to the 8G. And the Hermitian form on E gives you a symplectic form on Q. And so this gives you a corresponding embedding of the unitary Shimura variety, which has dimension G squared into A4G. And this is where your G squared over 16 comes from if you renormalize. So finally, just to say a couple words about um, other directions in the same vein. So um, a similar characterization exists for arbitrary Shimura varieties, where you end up having to look only for the compact Shimura varieties. Initially, um, it's actually my mistake, I thought the same method didn't work because you couldn't deform out the boundary in the way that you do here with A1 cross AG minus one. But in fact, you can, everything works the same. In terms of actually finding the maximal dimension, we don't have anything clean to say about that yet because given an arbitrary Shimura variety, what's the maximal dimensional compact Shimura subvariety of it, it's hard to say, but at the very least, you can make the clean statement for the maximal compact subvariety through a generic point being what it should be. Over finite fields, um, of course, you can wonder a lot of things. The same theorem is, is false because you have the, the locus where P torsion is zero, um, but you can at least wonder whether this generic statement holds. And I have to be careful what how to interpret this over finite fields, because if you just work over FP bar, there's no real generic point of AG, every point is CM. But you can still phrase this question by asking for not just one compact subvariety, but a family of compact subvarieties which spans all of AG. So globally dominant, to be precise. And then you can almost make the same argument work, uh, almost being the key word here, because I can't make it work, uh, and the reason we can't make it work is that we have to have an analog of the x annual theorem, now the transcendence theorem. You can formulate this transcendence theorem by working formally at uh, an ordinary point, at least, and using Serre-Tate coordinates. Uh, so we have a statement ready to go that if you could prove, you could prove the theorem. But as far as I know, no one knows how to prove these sort of formal transcendence theorems uh, in characteristic P. And uh, that's it. So thank you very much for your attention.